Good morning and welcome to the 2013 edition of Breastfeeding Grand Rounds, produced by the University of Albany School of Public Health with support from the Empire State Public Health Training Center and the New York State Department of Health. I'm Dr. Mary Applegate, the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice at the School of Public Health and host of this morning's broadcast. It's a pleasure to welcome you today. This year's Breastfeeding Grand Rounds is called It Takes a Village, Promoting Breastfeeding at the Community Level. With me in the studio, as always, is Dr. Ruth Lawrence, Professor of Pediatrics and Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, author of Breastfeeding, a Guide for the Medical Profession, a woman, in short, who barely needs an introduction to a breastfeeding audience. Also joining us for this year's broadcast is Ms. Stephanie Sosnowski, Chair of the Mid-Hudson Lactation Consortium and Deputy Director of the Maternal Infant Services Network of Orange, Sullivan, and Ulster Counties. Stephanie has been leading community-wide breastfeeding promotion efforts in that part of New York State for the past 20 years. Her region's breastfeeding rates show that she's very good at what she does. We had hoped to have a fourth person here today, Ms. Kim Marie Bug, founding director of ROSE, Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, a nonprofit organization that promotes and supports breastfeeding among African American mothers. Unfortunately for today's broadcast, but fortunately for every other reason, Kim was recently elected to the board of the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee and had to be in Washington today for her first USBC board meeting. She gave us permission to include clips in the broadcast from Rose's recent documentary, Reclaiming an African American Tradition. So even they, though she isn't here in person in the studio, she'll be part of the broadcast. As always, there'll be time in the second half of the broadcast for your questions. You can phone, fax, or email us your questions. While we're talking, please jot down questions so you'll be ready when we open the phone lines. Or you can just email us at any point during the broadcast at bfgr.ny at gmail.com. The phone number to call this morning is 800-452-0662. And the fax number is 518 518- 426-0696. If you do send a fax, please write legibly. At the end of the broadcast, please don't forget to fill out your evaluation and post-test. Those are both online. So the focus of today, as I said, is how to support breastfeeding at the community level. The first question is, why focus on the community level? And the major reason is that in the U.S., there are still huge disparities in breastfeeding rates among different um, racial subgroups in the population, particularly disparities in race and ethnicity and disparities by income level. And whenever we see these big disparities, you need to look really broadly at what are the reasons behind them and how can you address them. So before we really get started, let's hear from a couple of real experts on that subject. Kim Marie Bug herself, as well as Dr. David Satcher, the former Surgeon General. Rose is at the forefront of a movement to encourage African American mothers to embrace breastfeeding as a cultural and social norm. It's important for the health of mothers and babies, and we know that uh, African American women breastfeed less, and because of that, our babies do suffer more of many elements that could possibly be prevented if moms would breastfeed their babies. And also, moms have significant health benefits when they choose to breastfeed their babies. Rose is an acronym for reaching our sisters everywhere. It's important first that every child has the opportunity for a healthy start in life. And we know that breastfeeding is such an important part of that. We know that breastfeeding reduces infections in children. We know that uh, it reduces childhood obesity. It reduces sudden infant death syndrome risk. And it also benefits the mother. It, it hastens the cessation of bleeding of the uterus. And over time, it actually decreases the risk of breast cancer and, and uterine cancer in women. But by 2010, the 75% of all women in this country were breastfeeding. And 58% of African American women were breastfeeding. And by six months, only about 28% are still breastfeeding. We have a major problem. As Dr. Satcher said, Breastfeeding rates among African American mothers are much lower than rates among Caucasian and other mothers. Let's look for a minute at what are the national goals for breastfeeding. 
for decades from the start of the Healthy People program setting national objectives for health measures, the rates were the same. 75% breastfeeding initiation, 50% at um, six months and 25% at a year. Those were nice round numbers that were easy to measure. They stayed the same because we never reached those goals. Um, in the past 10 years, just a few years ago actually, we finally reached that 75% initiation rate, which means that it was time to reset the goals so we have a new target to aim for. You can't just aim for something that's lower than where you already are or you don't make progress. So here are the new um, breastfeeding goals for 2020. They're not as memorable as the old ones, but I'm doing my best. So the new breastfeeding initiation goal is 81.9%, six months 60.6%, and at 12 months 34.1%. I think it was just a formula increase from where we were at that time to get us to these new goals. Um, anyway, the, there's still a major stretch, especially in the duration ones. We're, we reached the initiation goal, but we, we were still fairly far away from the old duration at six and 12 months goals, so we've got a ways to go. Next, we have some data from the CDC showing how the rates have looked over the past 20 years. Here's a graph showing the progress that's been made since 1993. Um, these are initiation rates for the U.S. population as a whole, but when we look at population subgroups, the picture isn't quite so encouraging. You can see uh, before that last bar, we did reach the 75% target and have gone a bit beyond it. But when we look at the next slide, we can see that um, even though in all of the population subgroups that the, the CDC looked at, there has been upward progress during that time the progress among African Americans has been lower than among the others, and the disparities continue. Fortunately, the disparities are narrowing a bit, but they're still pretty significant. As you can see, rates among Latina mothers are higher, and in fact, they've been at the, those national targets for longer than rates among white women, but the rates among African Americans are persistently lower, and that's why our main focus this morning is going to be on promoting breastfeeding in African American um, communities. When we look at um, progress at the six-month mark, we see a similar picture, continuing upward progress, but still major disparities among the um, racial subgroups. So let's talk a little bit about what are the causes of some of these disparities. Poverty and maternal age are two of the common suspects when we look at other perinatal health disparities. You know, lower income women and younger mothers having higher rates of unfavorable outcomes. We've got some more CDC data looking at the combination of breastfeeding rates and race and poverty and maternal age. And you can see on this one, looking at race and poverty, in each of the racial groups, um, the low-income women have lower rates of breastfeeding than the upper-income women, but the disparities among racial gr groups persist even within the um, income groups. So the um, low-income women in the blue bars, the black low-income women are significantly less likely than white and Latina low-income women to breastfeed. Um, uh, so the disparities can't be just explained by the poverty effect. And in fact, among Latina women, the, there's almost no disparity between the poor and, and middle-income women. So we can't point to poverty as the reason why black women breastfeed less. By the same token, if you look at different maternal age groups, among the youngest mothers, they have the lowest breastfeeding rates. But if you look across racial groups, black teen mothers have lower rates than white teen mothers. And among Latinas, the um, age differences are, are least. So Clearly, the Latina community 
has got it right in a way that the others of us need to learn from. And especially, we need to figure out how to help the African American community achieve the same kinds of um, goals as the Latina women. So Dr. Lawrence, I know this is an issue that you've thought a great deal about over the years. Could you talk a bit about what we should be thinking about as the contributing factors here? Well, we have a tendency to think that African American women don't know how to breastfeed, and that isn't so far from the truth. Historically, they have always breastfed, and I had the privilege of training in New Haven with Dr. Edith Jackson, who brought breastfeeding back to this country along with uh, childbirth without fear and rooming in and all of those things were there in New Haven when I was trained. All the African American mothers were breastfeeding. I would go to, all my clinic mothers were breastfeeding and I'd say, how do you do that? And they'd look at me and say, well, you just put the baby there. And, and the baby figures it out. <laughs> that's right. And so what's happened is our cultural changes and forces kind of working against them, because then in clinic, uh, some of the doctors were saying, oh, you, sh you shouldn't bother to breastfeed. Let me give you a formula. You know, this is let me scientific. set you free. And, uh, this caught on in, in the African-American community because they prescribed formula and sort of told, that's old-fashioned, let's, let's do this other thing. So this was an problem. So there are a lot of problem. external forces, quite apart from poverty and quite apart from race. These mothers were led down another path. Mm -hmm. So anytime we've got these patterns that have become established over decades. We really need to um, look deeply at what are culturally appropriate role models and messages and resources to be available to communities. People need support from their community, from their families, from their peers. It can't, you know, even though it was the our predecessors' fault as doctors that we got into this mess in the first place, it isn't good enough just to say, you know, we're from the government, we're here to help, this is what you should do. You know, it's right. much too patronizing and isn't going to work with a, a deeply and, ingrained and, and kind so of many thing generations over the generations. Have yeah. There's nobody in their community to act as a model. And, and as birthing practices have changed over the years, we've also seen the way that mothers were allowed to birth have a big impact on their ability to breastfeed in those first hours. We know now how important that first hour is skin-to-skin -skin contact. I think back to my mother's generation, they were knocked out. There was no way that they could have breastfed, so of course they had to have formula for their babies. So I think in addition to supporting breastfeeding in the community, we really need to focus on reaching women before they have their baby, you know, hopefully in their teens when they're thinking about it, maybe. Uh, but really vital that our birthing practices help to make breastfeeding more successful. Yeah, and that's why a lot of the um, sessions of Breastfeeding Grand Rounds have focused on what can be done at these institutional right. levels to help make breastfeeding more possible. So this is kind of a complement to that, what can be done at the community level as well to help m as the name of the, right, mm -hmm. of the documentary from Rose says to reclaim a breastfeeding tradition, reclaim an African-American tradition in this case. So um, we came across, as we were getting ready for this, a slogan that I think was first developed in South Africa by a group of disability rights advocates, nothing about us without us. And I think that kind of encapsulates the issue here. We don't want us as a bunch of white professionals coming into the community and saying, we know what's best for you and this is how you should do it. It needs to really come from the community itself. So why don't we um, go back to the um, documentary from Rose and hear from Kim Marie Bug herself again. 
I met with a few young women um, at my house a few weeks ago. Um, had met these young women over the years, uh, many different, uh, at different times, but I just want you to see this two minute video. Everything you do, you gotta do it for love. Right, you would do anything for your daughter or your son. I'm not really sure why more African American women don't breastfeed. It's certainly the best thing for your baby, and it's 100% free. Maybe it's education. Maybe there's a stigma there. Maybe a lot of African-American women believe that breastfeeding is for um, mothers went back in the day, and, and now people just use formula. I've heard that people don't like for you to do it in public. Um, some people don't think that it's healthier than formula. I'm still kind of nervous about it because most mothers who breastfed, they told me that they have had a hard time doing it. So I'm just worried about that. But I think it'll be a good experience. So I think once they get educated enough on breastfeeding that they'll be more susceptible to actually doing it. It's just you know, basically about getting educated on doing it and why is it important to do it versus um, using you know, Similac and stuff like that. Okay. Breastfeed that baby. baby. If you want her to be real healthy. Yeah. A lot of the teen mothers, they're not really educated as to how and what and where and have the support of their family to um, to cater to their decision. People would say because he's, a, you know, a little taller than other kids and then he had teeth, you know, from the time I can probably remember. So they would say the same things like, um, you breastfeed him and he has all of those teeth, he doesn't bite you. So you get the stereotypical stuff, you know, you shouldn't be breastfeeding that long or, ew, that's nasty. And I'm like, why is it nasty? You know, what makes this nasty? I'm, nur I'm nurturing my child. Like not feeding as often as she should have. She, um, then she told me how her breast would get sore and she having gorge nipples and how it would hurt. And it's painful. If they had more access to informational meetings or workshops, they gave them information in the community about breastfeeding, and plus they don't see it a lot. I think African American women need the chance to meet and talk one on one with other African American mothers who breastfeed and really get the facts and decide for themselves if that's something that they would be willing to do. Looking farther back in history, as Dr. Lawrence was saying, African Americans almost all breastfed, but during the last half of the 1900s, in the efforts to sort of recover from the real dip in breastfeeding that was caused by the move toward scientific formula, a lot of those efforts involved middle class white women. I mean, peer support efforts like nursing, nursing Mothers Counselors and the La Leche League, despite its Spanish name, um, largely involved Anglo moms. In recent years, leaders in the black community, David Satcher, Kim Marie Bug, and others, have been working hard to reclaim that African American tradition. One of those le leaders has been Dr. Michael Young, who was our guest for Breastfeeding Grand Rounds 2004, in case anybody wants to revisit that. It's available on the website archived. But we have a clip from, from her from the uh, recent documentary. Let's go and listen to what she had to say there. Breastfeeding is the first food. It's the first immunization. It's the best thing next to mother's love that a mother can give her baby. This was our tradition to breastfeed for many years. And, and when the wars came along, women went to work, more women in the workforce, and formulas came in as a, a supplement, and then they took over. We spent $850 million per year in WIC to buy formula for families who could be breastfeeding. That's $435 per non-breastfed infant in the first year. WIC Women, Infants, and Children's Program initially was not really on the breastfeeding bandwagon. A lot of women got free formula without that education. I think WIC has really changed that. They are a big force in promoting breastfeeding. And I think we have work to do in that regard. In public health, when we think about community engagement, we work with what we call the socio-ecological framework. 
rec which recognizes that health in, is influenced by all kinds of different factors, not just whether somebody has access to health care or not. We have a graphic that shows what the socio-ecological framework looks like. It's a tiered approach starting at the individual and going out to interpersonal interactions, organizational environments that people have to interact with, live in, their communities, the values and ethos of a whole community, and then public policy issues. Today we're not going to talk so much about the public policy issues, but we're going to look at those community, organizational, and interpersonal layers of the um, socio-ecological framework. Dr. Lawrence, when we look at the individual level of that framework, that's the area where most healthcare providers are, are usually interacting. Pediatricians less so because pediatricians have always recognized that children don't occur in isolation. Children are part of families and you've got to deal with the whole family at least. But even so, most health care focuses on that individual level. Um, what are the major uh, issues that we deal with at that individual level? Well, we always think about education. As health care providers, we always want to educate everybody. But Derek Jelliff said something very interesting years ago, and he said breastfeeding is a confidence game. And probably our most re important responsibility is to instill confidence in the mother that she can do it because the baby knows what to do. It's not just a step-by-step, -step, do this, do this, do this, and this, and you will be That's fine. True. If you do it right, it's a matter That's of believing right. that you will do it right and your baby will do it right. right. It's, a, you can do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a big piece of the community education that we do at our agency. We've always believed very much so that women have the power to make these decisions, but they need some of the information. And we try not to make it too complicated. Really, the baby knows what to do. We just have to kind of let, let it happen. Moms and babies have been doing yes. this for a long <laughs> yes, time. We be here, yeah. And hopefully we'll continue yeah. to for a very long time and we won't be arrogant enough to think that we can figure out a better way yeah, than what yeah. Mother Nature has yeah. we know, invented you know, over the years. Corporate America is trying to take that away from us, but we, do, we can best. take it back. Yeah. Right, yeah. So when we move away from that, inter that individual level and move to the interpersonal level, there are tons of influences at that level for better and for worse. One of the most important is the role of the father in mm. helping to promote and support his partner in breastfeeding. Um, what are some of the uh, examples that you two have seen over the years of fathers really having a tremendously positive impact on the mom's ability to breastfeed? Well, you know, in my experience in working at the community level, we know that if we can get a father to be uh, present at the breastfeeding class or be present at the childbirth class, we know that that baby is really off to a good start because the mother needs so much support at the, at the whole, uh, you know, coming home from the hospital. Um, the, the fathers really make a big difference. The partner in her life really makes a big difference in helping her in other ways. And we spend a lot of time talking to the fathers about it's not your only job to feed the baby a bottle. There's so many other things. It's your child. Put the baby and it's on not your just a matter of I get to feed the baby right. or ick, I have to feed, yes. change, the change the diapers. Change the diapers, yeah. yeah. yeah lots well, of there's a chore that's very important, and that's non nutritive cuddling. Yes, absolutely. Babies need quieting and calming and that sort of thing from somebody who doesn't smell of milk. Yes. And that's yes, dad's yes, role. Yeah. Yeah. So in our prenatal classes, we talk to the fathers about how important it is to make that connection with the baby during the pregnancy. Talk to the baby, read a book to the baby. When that baby's born, he or she's going to recognize the father's voice and be comforted, as Dr. Lawrence said, on the father's chest. And in the hospital, uh, the father is not considered a visitor. He's considered part of the yes, family. Yes. He can come and go right. at his leisure. Right. He can spend the night. Right. He can be there. He's Fathers are no longer picture. segregated, yes. segregated <laughs> yeah. out in the right. dad's waiting right. room that right. are the subject of exactly. so many New Yorker cartoons yes. over the years. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And it is, uh, you know, if we look at the media um, way of presenting birth, we are seeing some changes, which is really nice. You know, instead of the mother screaming during labor, we're seeing some more, you know, natural birth and things like that on mm -hmm. sitcoms, which makes a big difference. Very well, that's where the title Childbirth Without Fear yeah. came from, <laughs> mm -hmm. was understand what's happening. Yes. 
because it becomes a vicious cycle. If Absolutely. you are afraid of it, you tense up and it just gets worse. But you can, I mean, there, I think with the growing popularity in the general public of things like yoga and yes. recognition yes. that yes. Um, calming and yes. centering can have a positive influence on all kinds of aspects of our lives. I think there's right. there at least hopefully a growing recognition that this is a really key place for that to happen too. Absolutely. Our agency, we now offer yoga for birthing, which is an integration of yoga breathing techniques to, along with the education part of childbirth and it's very successful. So it's the, not the couples all love the, it. The magic of those Lamaze no, not breathing at all. techniques. Not at it's all. just not having not at all. Oh, an approach to getting that focus right. and calm. Right. And as a childbirth educator, Lamaze has been one of the, the leading organizations in really leading the change. They have come away from, you know, <laughs> as being the only thing you learn to really promoting natural and, and normal birth as normal, which is a wonderful concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we were talking about dads a minute Oh, ago. dads, yes. And, and we have <laughs> dads, a, yes. another <laughs> clip from the uh, documentary that's specifically about dads. The beginning of it is pretty funny, actually. Yes. So let's take a look at that. The mom that's delivering the newborn, she's the quarterback, she's the head coach, she's the, the wide receiver, the tail, she's in charge. At least once a month uh, we gather men who are going to be new, new dads, our, our expecting fathers together, and we answer any questions that they may have. Another key group in that interpersonal level of the socio-ecological model are the people I would call the role models. The grandmothers, the aunts, the sisters, the friends, people who have had successful breastfeeding experiences in the past, and they can provide all kinds of um, informal education and support and encouragement for the new breastfeeding mom. When a community loses its breastfeeding tradition, that group of role models is one of the f first interpersonal connections to disappear and one of the hardest to rebuild. I mean, we can re-educate health professionals as long as we want, but until you've had enough time for there to be members of the community available to serve in that role model, role model kind of interaction, it's an uphill, an uphill climb. Um, how have you seen all of that kind of thing play out in your communities? Uh, well, again, back to the, we do community level prenatal breastfeeding classes and birth education. And I know that if um, I find out that the mother herself has been breastfed, it's like, yay, we've got um, a grandmother who really can support her. And that's like a big hurdle, knowing that when she comes home from the hospital, her own mother's gonna be able to support her in her choice to breastfeeding instead of fighting with her, saying, I wanna feed the baby, you sleep you know, for six hours, and, and yeah, or, we have or, this free case of formula, let's use this, so. Yeah, or, or saying, you think that those make enough milk for that yes, baby? Yes, yes, you know, yes. Yeah. Saying all kinds yeah, of undermining yeah. things. You know, we have great tools that we use in our classes now just, you know, showing the, the mother and the grandmother and the father, whoever is there with her, you know, really how tiny a newborn's belly is. They don't need two ounces of formula to we be did full. not just give right. birth to a football <laughs> yeah. player who needs yeah. to drink gallons yeah. of yeah. this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, reaching the community is really important and we've been doing that for a long time. Just, in, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you know, just having places in the community where moms can feel comfortable breastfeeding their baby. If they come into our agency, we have breastfeeding friendly signs up and it, ma it makes a big difference to know that they're supportive. We have uh, role models now that women tend to look at celebrities. So we do have some important celebrities. Well, not important, but we have some celebrities now that have chosen to breastfeed. So I think that's a really and going really, public and going public. Yeah, really, 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 yeah. really, really great thing. And um, I know that the uh, Kellogg Foundation just reported some really. I don't think it's news to those of us in the field uh, information, but I think it really raises a level of awareness among the general population that most people believe in breastfeeding, that it's the right thing to do for your baby, but when it comes to being able to continue breastfeeding, sometimes that's difficult, and that's why we're here today, because mothers and families need that support in their community. When they leave the hospital, they need somebody to say, it's okay, you can do this, and we're here to make it easier for you. 
Yeah, that Kellogg Foundation study, they produced this wonderful infographic that I just saw it yesterday for the first mm -hmm. time, so too late to insert into the handouts for today, but the Kellogg Foundation's website is w kkf.org and if you look on there you'll be able to get it. It's a great graphic and it would have been perfect for this because it <laughs> talks about the percent of people who believe that hospitals should adopt breastfeeding friendly practices. They talk about the num number of people who believe that work sites ought to adopt breastfeeding friendly practices. Oh, you have a copy there. I do. What are the other uh, things that they... Um, well, 68% 60, of their uh, polled group believe that there should be baby-friendly or breastfeeding-friendly hospitals, that 66% of the people polled felt that there should be more support in the workplace, and we know that's a real issue. We have federal Department of Labor uh, laws now, as well as here in New York State, but we know that women have a lot of difficulties when they go back to work and trying to have their employer really accommodate them. 71% um, said that they would like to see public spaces for breastfeeding, for nursing, and not be told, you know, if you're in a grocery store that you have to go find the bathroom to breast. Nobody wants or to go eat a meal. Your car <laughs> or go or out something. to your car. Yeah. 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 Well, I think we need to have a cheer for Kellogg Foundation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. They yes. joined yes. us yeah. five years ago supporting the first summit. Now they are using all of their resources to support breastfeeding. Yeah, and they're and doing a lot most of work incredible. at this community level. So, uh, exactly. They're offering uh, grants. They've funded over 100 places who are trying to support breastfeeding. So um, eat your cornflakes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, that's what breastfeeding has needed is, is some financial backing. We've never had that because breastfeeding doesn't cost anything. Yeah, and, and, and there nobody aren't, earns a profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and there are Other major profits to be <laughs> earned by the formula companies who um, are trying to undermine efforts to breastfeed while putting on a gloss of, yes. oh yes, we're very yeah. breastfeeding yeah. friendly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, looking at that graphic, it, it's very encouraging that such high numbers are supportive, but I also think to myself, we got to get to those 30 plus percent Abs who don't yes. think that yeah. employers have any role right. here. We need right. to get to the 30 plus percent who don't think that hospitals have a role. So there's, you know, the numbers are, are good, but they're not where we need them to be. And that's part of this whole, right. looking at it at mm -hmm. the community level. <coughs> so getting back to the interpersonal um, peer support role model thing, while we're waiting for the next generation to pass and get to the point that we've got a whole cadre of grandmothers um, who have had positive breastfeeding experiences themselves, um, WIC in particular has done a lot to try to make up for that by developing a huge peer counselor program. And Stephanie, that's a lot of what you do yes, at work. Yes, so yes, it, It's absolutely that? wonderful. The, uh, at least in New York State, the, every WIC agency is uh, mandated to have a peer counseling program and I've had the, the privilege of starting the one in Orange County with our uh, local health department. Peer counselors are exactly, they're, they're women who were or are WIC participants themselves who have breastfed their own babies, have experience with it. We've had tremendous, tremendous increases in breastfeeding rates. When we first started there, less than half of the mothers that came to WIC even thought about breastfeeding and now we've increased it, we've almost doubled that. So we have almost, it's really remarkable that the, the whole um, feeling in the WIC clinic has changed from the, the time that we started there three years ago. We started with three peer counselors, we have two wonderful peer counselors now, moms that do just incredible work in supporting their peers and it makes such a difference when you have a, a WIC mom come in and we have another WIC mom who can talk to her about how much easier it is to breastfeed and how we can support you. Our peer counselors have 24-7 phones they can call anytime. We're working on getting our peer counselors into the hospitals so that they're there as soon to as meet the, the moms to meet right the mom away. right there yeah. because we know that a lot of times in that first week when moms are not supported, when they come back to WIC, it's like, well, what happened? We thought you were going to breastfeed. Well, this, that, and the other thing. So we're trying to do our best. And, and there are WIC agencies that already have 
peer counselors in hospitals. So we've used that as a model. We do in Rochester. Yes, it, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really is, is a great model. And I know WIC is really trying to get away from being the formula people, and they're doing a wonderful job of becoming the breastfeeding people. Right, right. And Dr. Michael Young on that video clip we saw mentioned that in in its early years, WIC really was yeah. inadvertently doing a lot to undermine breastfeeding, yeah. but they, yeah. over the past 10, 20 years, have made a huge turnaround and have become major supporters of right. breastfeeding. So we really hope that at the federal level, the funding continues for the peer counselor program because everything is always so on the chopping block, but it's such an effective program. We're saving so much money and not giving these babies formula for months and months. In increasing, improving their health, improving the mother's health as well, it makes no sense at all to get rid of a, a wonderful program like that. Well, the original model for that was the Lesh League, of yes. course, because they were peer counselors, the, uh, and they continue to work and yes. model that concept. Yes. Uh, and we have our peer counselors go to the La Leche League meetings, so they're known in the community. We work together with our La Leche League group in all kinds of activities, so it really is wonderful. The hospital in our community now has a mom support group. Our peer counselors are there. So it really makes a nice community level of support. Yeah. Well, and as you can imagine, Kim Marie Bug has done a lot with peer counselors with Rose. So let's take a look at the clip from the documentary that has some of her peer counselors talking about their experiences in that role. As someone who works in an area where there aren't a lot of African Americans in general, the ones that I do meet in the WIC uh, offices, I really, really, you know, want to target them and help them see that it's not taboo in our culture or in our community, that it's something that's beautiful and we want to embrace it. And so that's really my mission. Sometimes moms just don't want to do it, and I hear it all the time in my clinic. Well, I can't do it because I've got to go back to work in school or every Friday I have to get my hair done and no one wants to keep the baby because he always wants to be on the breast. And when they see a peer counselor and we're working and we're going to school and we're looking like they are and we're going through everything they're going through and we're still able to breastfeed and they'll ask you, how, how did you do it? And we'll tell them. They want to know who else is breastfeeding, especially my dads when they come in class. Did you know that Michael Jordan was breastfed for three years? And they're like, oh. Well, maybe it's okay. I had a mom actually a week ago that I helped. She's 39, and this is her third child. Um, her oldest is in the military, 19 years old, so it was like starting all over for her. But um, she had flat nipples and didn't think that she could do it, and I did a home visit. She got the baby latched on, and she was so happy. So you can see that those young women have much more credibility with the population yes. we're trying to reach than any of us would really I and mean, they look at us and think oh you've got all <laughs> yeah. kinds of advantages how am I supposed to do it in my life but having right. peer counselors right. who have done it in right. lives very similar to the women we're trying to yeah. reach makes a huge right. huge difference the, the peer counselors understand about food stamps and all those things that are, are just part of their lives and, and our peer counselors have done such a marvelous job as as educators and as mothers really being great role models for the moms that come into the WIC program. Mm -hmm. And it gives them positive yeah. reinforcement it's, it's, yeah. and empowerment yes. for themselves yes. too. So it has yes. Yes. advantages on all kinds yes. of levels. Yes. And I think that's one of the beauties of the WIC program. They re we really encourage them to continue with their education and continue education. We provide them with opportunities to go to conferences and breastfeeding conferences. I'm always sharing things with them and uh, we have regular meetings. It really is a very successful program. It, it's going to make a big difference. You know, and, and as more and more hospitals and other organizations get interested in improving their breastfeeding rates, right. there's a potential career ladder even for people yes. who start out as right. peer mm -hmm. counselors to mm -hmm. become lactation counselors and right. IBCLC lactation mm -hmm. uh, experts in future mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we know, you know, for hospitals that are working on baby friendly or 10 steps or whatever they're doing, that uh, a big piece of it is having that connection to the community and the, and the peer counselors really make that easy for them to do. They just have to connect with their local WIC agency. So why don't we move on now to the next level of that socio-ecological model to the whole organizational environment. This is the level that we've talked about in lots of past breastfeeding grand mounds the hospital environment, the workplace environment, et cetera. Um, 
all of those past broadcasts are available on the website if you want a full recap of what we talked about then. But let's do a brief overview of what the major organizations at that level are that we need to be thinking about. Uh, the most obvious one is the healthcare environment. Um, as we've talked already a bit before, um, the birthing environment itself has a major impact on the success of breastfeeding initiation. And if breastfeeding doesn't get off to a good start, it can't get off to a good continuation. So really, even though the amount of time people spend in the birthing environment is shrinking, what happens in that environment has a huge impact. We can usually help them, but it, it's unnecessary. If, if things would have gone better in the hospital, we wouldn't have these issues a week later or two weeks later. You know, and on, on surveys like the Maternity Center Association, they're now called Childbirth Connections, they did a big survey recently that showed that trouble getting breastfeeding gr going was the number one cause for early weaning in the first couple weeks of the breastfeeding experience. So really getting that good start is key to success through the rest of the breastfeeding year or two or three. Mm -hmm. um, with the African American community, another important part of the healthcare environment that we need to think about is the NICU. African Americans have higher rates of premature babies and low birth weight babies, so higher numbers of babies who spend time in the neonatal intensive care unit. Conveniently enough, Kim Marie Bugg's husband is the director of neonatology at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta, and he and their daughter, who's a future obstetrician, um, both uh, appeared on, in clips on the um, documentary, so why don't we hear from them next. Breastfeeding is a very important topic to us because the infants uh, who are born prematurely really need the nourishment that they get from the mother's milk. The artificial substitutes made from cow's milk uh, does not really provide the protection that these babies need in their first few months of life. And it also increases their risk of uh, a third infection called necrotizing intercolitis if they don't get mother's milk. So for our babies, it can be a matter of life and death. I really am thinking about becoming OBGYN, and I feel like this conference is really important because I do want my patients to breastfeed their babies because I know the importance that I've learned from just attending this conference, the benefits for the baby, the benefits for the mother. So that's it for the Bug Family Hour on <laughs> Breastfeeding Grand Rounds. You know, it's so cool to see their daughter yes, following her yes, parents' yes. footsteps into this world. It's so, it's so important to reach the younger generation. Uh, my agency has been working in the middle and high schools in our region for a long time, really talking to young people about their futures as potential parents. And when you bring up breastfeeding, they're like sponges. They've never really had anybody talk to them about it, and they all get it. They get it. So hopefully, you know, the next generation will, will have to fight so much with right, <laughs> getting right. them to understand how great it is. That that job will have been done. Yes. Check mark. So th another really key organizational environment that women have to deal with in terms, especially of the continuation part of breastfeeding is the workplace environment, which again we've talked about over and over again on past breastfeeding grand rounds. Um, codified in lots of state laws, including one in New York State and now in the Federal Affordable Care Act, there are some requirements on workplaces that they need to provide time for breastfeeding mothers to either breastfeed or pump during the workday, and they need to provide spaces for them that aren't just the bathroom down the hall to do the pumping. Um, so uh, unfortunately in the past, a lot of employers, even if they have accommodated the, um, okay, you can have a space to pump, it's really not much more than a, a bathroom and may be a bathroom. So um, our next humorous clip from the documentary is what if we all had to eat in the bathroom from a group called Table for Two. So Table for Two is a community organization that seeks to establish public lactation rooms for breastfeeding moms. So would you eat in the bathroom? We went to undergrad at Clark Atlanta University just right around the corner and we took over a bathroom at Clark. We said, hey, we'll feed you guys if we can put you in a bathroom 
and take photos. And now they are ambassadors for breastfeeding. How about that? So Stephanie, please talk about what the New York Statewide wow. Coalition uh, has been doing to support well, employers. Uh, the New York Statewide Breastfeeding Coalition, back in 2008, I believe, we received a grant through the United States Breastfeeding Committee to provide training of the Business Case for Breastfeeding Toolkit, which is a wonderful document that's available online now at our um, womenshealth.gov website. But we were able to train over 350 health and human service providers throughout New York State from Long Island all the way up to Buffalo to help them reach out to businesses to educate them on why it was so important for their business. The bottom line would be improved if they were able to support their nursing mothers at the workplace. And fortunately, we had the passage of, in 2007 of the New York State Nursing Mothers in the Workplace Law. So it really gave us a little bit of teeth to go out and, and reach out to organizations. And the, the best and easiest thing that happened was that because so many of the people that attended the trainings already worked in agencies, we said, start there. Look at your own organization, your healthcare agency, and see what you can do to make some changes. And we did see a lot of positive changes. The statewide coalition was able to offer some mini grants to help them work with local businesses, even if it was something as small as providing a refrigerator for that business so the mother could put her you know, pumped milk in the, in the refrigerator during the day, or perhaps they needed to buy a screen, or they needed a lock. It, it didn't have to be much, but we were able to at least reach out to many businesses, and since then, the New York State Department of Health WIC program has actually come out with a new toolkit called Making It Work, which is aimed at employers and employees of low income wage earners. So, you know, whereas the business case for breastfeeding toolkit was really sort of very corporate America and we know if you have an office, of course you can close your door and, and you can pump for the most part. But if you're working at McDonald's or a bodega, there it, it's not the same there thing. There are big challenges. Very that, challenging. So the New York State WIC program, the, the department went out and uh, through a grant and they put together this wonderful toolkit with lots of really great ideas and how small businesses can accommodate nursing mothers. It might be something in New York City where one of the perineal networks that is a community uh, network opened up a lactation room that all the businesses and all the women that work on, you know, within their block can come in and use. Simple ideas like that, even, you know, in, in upstate where there were mother, uh, women that work on the, um, like the telephone line, you know, they could go in their truck, but they looked at portable tents like you take to a beach and you just pop it open and she was able to pump and you, you can plug your pump in you know some of them even operate on a battery manual expression works too but it gave her the privacy and she was able to pump and it's just simple things like so that th just these were telephone line yes, workers yes yes yeah. yes not not yeah. at first i thought you were not a telephone no, call no, no, center no, no yeah out in the line you know in their trucks yeah. climbing those poles and doing whatever they do up in the air there uh, but moms mothers do all, all kinds, kinds of, of work jobs yeah now and the, tool, the both toolkits really have a lot of information that you should access. And if you, if you come to the New York State uh, Breastfeeding Coalition's website, we have a lot of links to all that stuff on there. Of course, we have our Facebook page. We have a lot of uh, followers there. And we're always giving information and links there as well. But the fact that here in New York State, we have the support of the health department. We have the support of the statewide coalition. We have the support of, um, in, in very, um, the... New York State Health Department has funded perinatal networks for the past 20 years, and those are one of the great community-level places where we find that women can be supported in breastfeeding. Yes, yeah, so we're lucky in this state yes. to have lots of layers yes. of support available. Yes, yes. Um, and even in other states, many states now have developed statewide and regional networks as well as lots of national-level mm -hmm. resources from mm -hmm. the CDC, from uh, the uh, womenshealth.gov. Right. And really all following that framework that you mentioned earlier, it's, it's a great tool to use to help you focus on what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Figure out which level you need mm -hmm. to operate on and what are the mm -hmm. levers you can do. Yeah. So one of the sort of cornerstones of workplace support has always been the lactation room. And I know the University of Rochester, Strong Hospital, has a fabulous lactation room with rocking chairs and pumped-in music and privacy screens and all elite. kinds of... Yeah. It, yeah. Hmm? The elite 
pumping yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like yeah. the gold standard <laughs> of gold standards for lactation rooms, but they don't, um, I mean, as you said, the pop-up tent can be an extremely simple lactation room. We have a photograph of something in between those two um, yeah. extremes <laughs> that, I mean, and a, an employer can provide a lactation room without going to huge expense and still have what right. you need to have, right. you know, a comfortable chair, a refrigerator to store the milk, a pump to plug in an electric pump, mm -hmm. and, and some place close by to, to wash up, yeah, and to a, wash the parts in your hands. Yeah, sink, yeah. yeah. so that's one yeah. of the, the sink yeah. was one of the reasons yeah. people got moved yeah. into bathrooms, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. you can have it next to the bathroom so there's a sink nearby. Right. But, and yeah, as so little as, as four feet by five feet, uh, they really can be, you know, look for that unused closet somewhere and, and you can revamp it. And there are actually organizations that can help you do that. So, and we can get you the link to those too. But it doesn't have to be the elaborate. <laughs> as in design. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this is on the first floor of the hospital. It's accessible to everybody. Everyone. And we agonized over the name. It's called the Pump Place. <laughs> Seems appropriate. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. It, you know, you could see an engineer running in there with a <laughs> clamp. With some devices. Yeah, yeah. But really, no, no, different kind of pump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, in, uh, in, uh, in the county, one of the counties that I work in, one of the first places that made some changes for the business case for breastfeeding was, was the hospital and really looked at their own HR policy. And yes, if you were a nurse, you knew that you could go up to the to the you know to the maternity floor and use their pump and have their office but if you were a custodian or you worked someplace else you had no idea so just putting that into their HR policy to let everybody know that yeah any employee can come up here they made a nice room it's it's not as elaborate as you know the one that we just saw on the screen but really nice and clean and comfortable and there is a, a public one now down by the you know the emergency room so the families that are coming and have a place to go to well we have we have pumping places all across the university so it's uh, permeating. Model programs, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Not surprisingly. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. of the organizations that received a mini grant from us was Cornell University. So we know that they went to make some changes in their campus yeah. as well. Good. Well, and as you said, you can have the greatest lactation room, but if only the people in the know <laughs> yes. are aware of it, yeah. it's not yeah. much good. Yeah. So making changes like <coughs> Uh, in the human resources office, whenever somebody inquires about maternity leave, that should be a trigger to provide them exactly, with information about exactly. the breastfeeding support exactly. that's available. Right. Once and that's they get why, back. you know, when we are worth working with a, a mom who's pregnant, we talk to her about her plan for going back to work and how important it is for her to reach out to her HR department now and let them know that these are the things that she's going to need because you don't want to show up when you come back six weeks ago, where's my pump room? And the you know, HR is like, oh. So if you go in and one of the great tips that we gave at our training from Kathy Carruthers was that you should go back with your baby and let everybody see how beautiful and this is why you're doing this, you know, during your six or eight weeks or whatever limited maternity leave you have, let everybody see how wonderful your baby is. And how they are flourishing because they're being yes. breastfed and yes. how you're yes. not going to be homesick all the time with the baby because the baby's being breastfed and therefore is right. not getting ear right. infections all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, and so we've talked about lactation rooms, but that isn't absolutely necessary. Sometimes the major adjustment that an employer needs is an attitude adjustment. Uh, yes. <laughs> and just being supportive and helping figure out, even if it's a small place and they can't set up a whole lactation room, what can they do short of sending you to the bathroom or sending you to your car that would accommodate your need to pump during the workday and mm -hmm. take breaks and that kind of thing. So having, having a positive, supportive, let's figure it out kind of attitude can go a huge amount of the way toward Absolutely. finding a solution. Absolutely. As we see in the, the photos here, we have a mom who has her baby with her. What what better place? Right. You know, you've solved a lot of, of issues. And, you know, until the baby's actually mobile, mom can wear the baby, mom can accomplish a lot of things. Baby at work. does spend a fair amount of time sleeping. Sleeping. And so yeah. they can sleep mm -hmm. near the mom. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as the baby isn't too cute and <laughs> too <serves laughs> as a distraction to everybody else. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. can work out really yeah. well. You and know, uh, and after, after a while, even the cutest babies are sort of part of the background yeah. and people yeah. stop yeah. fussing over right. them. And, you know, getting your colleagues to not feel like you're 
getting something they're not. I mean, for years people took cigarette breaks and they were gone for, you know, probably two hours out of the whole day and nobody, you know, complained about them. But a, a nursing mom needs to go pump for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and, yeah, what is she getting that I'm not? So, yeah. you know, having the education um, office-wide is really important too. Yeah. So often with the workplace environment, the other environment that really needs to be accommodating is the child care setting. Oh, yes. Because yes. not everybody has the wherewithal to have a, a nanny at home to support the breastfeeding mom when she goes back to work. Um, and not everybody has a grandma who can retire right at the moment that <laughs> yeah. the grand, first grandbaby yeah, yeah. is born and become that uh, stay-at-home nanny for the baby. So having supportive childcare environments is also a key part of the whole thing. Um, what are some successful models of that that you guys have seen? Well, I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Mary Applegate at the State Health Department, when you were with the State Health Department, um, developing best practices for child care centers in New York State, and it's been a great tool to have. Um, the New York Statewide Breastfeeding Coalition, we take emails, we get, you know, calls and, and things from mothers who have issues, and we're able to send them to the State Health Department website. So here's a list of breastfeeding-friendly child care centers. Here's a list of things that your child care center can do or should be should doing. Should be doing, yeah. Should be doing. Breast milk is not a toxic substance and, you know. You don't need to wear rubber you gloves. gloves and, you don't need things. to put on a mask. Yeah, yeah. And those children are healthier. I mean, why, why not support that? Um, in, in my agency, it's one of the things I've done over the years is gone to the Head Starts and the daycare centers and any child care council that will have me and come and talk to them about how easy this is to support breastfeeding mothers. Um, all they need to do, they, even if they just have a place where the mother can get my pamphlet and say, well, just call this agency and they can help you, or, or a list of the La Leche League groups, or you know, a list of la, uh, lactation consultants, a, a book, anything at all. But to not chastise the mother because she wants to come to the daycare center to breastfeed her baby. She has an hour for lunch. She's coming in. And we had that recently with a, a child care center uh, on Long Island who didn't want the mother to come in and breastfeed. They said, oh, you have to you know, go out in your car with your baby. It, it was just ridiculous. Crazy, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. But and this stuff is still happening. that's a setting where an attitude adjustment yes. is really the yes. biggest thing that needs yes. to happen. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, for uh, some of the Head Starts that I've worked with, they've just been wonderful. You know, they're federally funded agencies, so they, they kind of have a lot of rules to follow. But they've been wonderful. I mean, they've accommodated the mothers with, with nursing places. And then because they already have it there, their staff can use it. So it's really perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So. Dr. Lawrence, did you have anything you wanted to comment on about child care centers? Well, I could give you a list of ones that have cooperated <laughs> mm. and been wonderful. And uh, we have to get rid of that term breastfeeding Nazis. Oh, you know, right, right. Uh, we are and, not and Nazis. And have people realize it's yeah. normal yeah. and yeah. it's the best thing that could happen yeah. for yeah. a baby. And, and I think, you know, as, a, as an advocate, breastfeeding advocate myself, I think that one of the real important messages is that we're not trying to force people to breastfeed. We'd, we're trying to help them reach their own goals. Exactly, right. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's the sad part. We're often portrayed as people who are forcing women yeah, to do yeah, what they don't yeah. want to do. Yeah. But in fact, um, as the, um, the website Best for Babes, mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. they point out what's really out there in the community is not people being forced to breastfeed, it's these booby traps that mm -hmm. undermine women's ability to reach the goals they set for themselves. Mm -hmm. And all of this community support is about helping people avoid those booby traps and, and be able to reach their own goals. Right, we know from you know, research, a study that was done in New York City that I think close to 90% of the women that were giving birth said they wanted to breastfeed, but we you know within a week or so they're not breastfeeding. Yeah, because, because of all the issues they hit they all encounter. the potholes in yeah. the road. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So our goal here is to pave over the potholes. Pave it over, yes. <laughs> yeah. So beyond their role as employers, businesses can. I mean, we've mentioned a couple times. Um, lactation rooms that were set up for employers that then were open to the general public. Um, that's an excellent example of how a business as a key part of a community can really go a long way to making a community breastfeeding friendly. Um, what are some other examples you can think of of breastfeeding friendly things that a business can do? Well, you know, even if it's a restaurant, 
to not throw a mother out for breastfeeding her baby, you know, or, or thinking they're terrorists. Not or, making you know? a big fuss about <laughs> yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, Real, absolutely not making a big fuss. And we did see, I think that was a couple of weeks ago, that it, it made the news, it made the national news that somebody actually wrote, paid for their pizza because they were very happy that she was breastfeeding her baby. And we need more people to pat moms on the back when they do see them breastfeeding and not and look over your shoulder and like, oh, what they're doing. Say, yes, that's really great. That's mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful that you're breastfeeding. We're really you know, happy and proud that you've made that choice for your baby. Um, in uh, Ulster County, where one of my uh, counties that I work in, l working with the businesses there to give them a little sticker for their window. This is the breastfeeding friendly business. In Orange County, we have little stickers. This is a breastfeeding friendly, you know, workplace. So just little recognition a like that. A pat on the back a for the business. Back. Yes, and yes. it changes the environment yes. for breastfeeding moms out there if they see these little stickers right. all over the place right. and think, right. oh, I right. could go there. Right. They're right. supportive of what I'm doing. Right. You know, it, yeah. it just changes yeah. the the environment in, yeah. in subtle yeah. but important ways. Until the day we don't have to do that anymore when everybody right. just when, thinks it's Of course it's, it's breastfeeding right. friendly yeah. like yeah. most of the rest of the, the world rest is. The rest of the world, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we in our region and actually in lots of places in New York State, breastfeeding cafes, baby cafes, in, in my neck of the woods we do our baby talk. So just places for mothers to come, bring their babies, chat with other mothers. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, entrance fees or anything like that. You don't have to be a member. It's you don't just have a place to be part of the club. No, the club. Uh, and really mother to mother support is really very, very crucial in uh, you know, they can commiserate with each other about what they're going through and, you know, what their baby is doing. Sometimes it gets a little out of hand. We have to kind of, you know, bring the conversation back to what's appropriate. It's but, not all but, terrible out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Let's find yeah. some, let's be solution yeah, oriented yeah. here and yeah, not just yeah. be a gripe session. Yeah, yeah. which is r really nice for the, the baby cafes, which really has a nice format and they're um, licensed, you know, organizations. Um, breastfeeding cafes, which a lot of the New York State perinatal networks run in their community. We do baby talk, just a drop in weekly. We don't even like to call it a support group. It's just a weekly chatting, that's mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. A place where you can come yeah. and bring your baby or mm -hmm. presumably not bring your baby if baby's having some quality time and walk in the park with dad yeah, or whatever. Absolutely. Just a comfortable place mm -hmm. to come and talk about mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, great models. So um, we have a couple of pictures of other kinds of community organizations and what they do. And one, Stephanie, is from... <laughs> your county health yes. department's WIC <laughs> office. There's our little, we, uh, our peer counselors decorate our bulletin board uh, for the season. That was from our fall season. But one we of guessed. the, yeah, yeah, one of the, the, uh, the nice things I think in educating is that we share the clinic space with the public health clinic. So there are no more formula ads. There are no more pictures of bottles anywhere. There's breastfeeding <gasps> stuff every place. So even though they're not WIC participants, they have to sit and look at all that stuff too. So just raising that level of awareness that breastfeeding is normal. So it's if come, somebody normal. comes in for their flu shot, yes. they're going to see all this breastfeeding <laughs> yes, stuff and yes. they'll see yeah. breastfeeding is right. normal. Yes. And they, they're sitting there for an hour so they can look at all of our posters. And a lot of times we have something playing on the, the DVD player that's appropriate. The other picture that was there was of our rock and rest tent, which we've been doing at the county fairs in our region. And not that it was my idea. I got it probably 15 years ago from, I think it was down south, but going to the county fairs where, of course, you can breastfeed anywhere you want, but to make a nice little comfortable spot with a, some shade, we rent a tent. Uh, you can see it's really simple. There's just a table, there's a rocking chair in the back. We had some bottled water, a fan, a changing table for the moms, and it's just wonderful. We have people who are not breastfeeding come and just say, what are you doing in here? And look around and they, oh, this is a really great in thing. In exchange I wish you were for here. learning a little about yes. breastfeeding, you can sit here too, yeah. as oh, long yes. as there's we, not a mom The shade is, shade is fine for everybody, but you know, we have them at the um, Ulster County Fair, Sullivan County, um, Dutchess County Fair, and it's grown now that we have other organizations that are helping us with it, not just me running around, you know, trying to set like everything up. Person. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, the mothers that come back every year looking for us now. So it's really, it's really been great. Mothers yeah. of all kinds, fathers, grandmothers, they all come back. So and this is county fair season. County so fair season. Yes. If your county does not have a rock and rest tent, this is the time to implement one. Very easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, an easy way of again making it just part of the normal atmosphere for the community. Right, and the and the county fair people are, are happy to have some place that the mommies can go. You're doing a service for them, and you know we're not we're not 
you know, a business, and we're not, you know, yeah. going yeah, against not anybody. Not everybody is comfortable just sitting at a table at the concession area, right, right. breastfeeding in that much in public, and so having a quieter space yes. um, can be very good yeah, for them, too. Yeah. And we have, you know, the volunteers that come in are from local agencies and organizations, so they bring their information. They're able to reach out to families that otherwise may not know that they were around. So it works as for long everybody. As they don't have little formula ads on the no, back that's, page. No, that's in, in my rules of being a participant in the Rock and Rest. There are no formula promotional items ever. No pacifiers, no anything at all. So they've well, gotten the message. This is much better for an older child who is being breastfed. Um, yes. Because they're so distractible. Yes. I mean, they, yes. right. yes. they like to Absolutely. nurse and look around yes. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. So. Yeah. And at a county yeah. fair, there is so much to see that it's yeah. hard to keep and them mommies, focused. Yeah, especially for the older ones, it's nice to get them away from all that cotton candy. <laughs> Everything yes, distracting, cotton right? candy, too. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, and just have a little downtime yeah. so that they aren't yeah. as high strung, whether yeah. they're eating tons of cotton candy or not. <laughs> Hopefully yeah, they're not. Just but a little quiet yeah. oasis in the middle yeah, of the hubbub. Yeah. Crayons and coloring books for the older kids, a little table for them, so mm -hmm. diapers, wipes. Yeah, a little family-friendly mm -hmm. oasis. Excellent. Um, another key part of communities are faith communities, and whether it's Christian, Muslim, Jewish, um, Hindu, Unitarian Universalist, I mean, there's a major role for communities in setting community for faith communities in setting community values and um, just being part of the the atmosphere that um, families are surrounded by. Dr. Lawrence, you have had special relationship with this, having met with was it Pope John Paul the Second, Second yes. on the subject of <laughs> breastfeeding. So why don't you? lead our discussion about faith communities. And well, as a matter of fact, we did look at this back in the 90s and, and realized that the Quran, for instance, has uh, information about breastfeeding and suggests that you breastfeed for at least two years. The Old Testament says the same thing. A mother should breastfeed her infant for at least two years. And the Christian religion had nothing. <laughs> and this, uh, at that time, uh, Pope John Paul II was touring the world, particularly underdeveloped countries, and we thought, what a spokesperson. So a small group of us, 16 in total, who were very ecumenical. We had a few Catholics, but we had some agnostics and some <laughs> atheists in the group, but we all went to see Pope John Paul II. We spent three days at the Vatican preparing a statement for him and um, then we were taken to his private quarters and we presented the statement. Uh, Bishop McCune from uh, Trenton, New Jersey, in all his garb, presented the statement to the Pope and we sat there in this little room with him. And Pope John Paul II did pontificate that the women of the world Literally should breastfeed. Literally pontificated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, he did. And he published this and all of this sort of thing. And then he greeted each one of us as well. So it was a very awe-inspiring event. But the most important thing was that he spoke out and re suggested that the women of the world should assume their role of breastfeeding their, their infants. It's a beautiful piece if you like mm -hmm. want to read that. Yeah. Well, and, and after all, you know, all those little bracelets, what would Jesus do, what would Jesus <laughs> eat, eat right? was definitely yeah. breast milk. Yeah. 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 There yeah. were not alternatives yeah. at the time. Right. So, so and, and we've seen some wonderful initiatives in New York City. They had a wonderful faith-based initiative which really worked with the churches to help them understand how to support breastfeeding mothers, not to you know, throw them in a bathroom. Um, so if you go to the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, you can actually click on the, the links for that information. But at the USBC conference that I went to several years ago, I went to a wonderful um, workshop from, presented by some faith-based organizations. And the tremendous work, the changes that they were able to do when they got behind it. I mean, there's a lot of faith-based organizations out there. Right. If you can get them behind and supporting this, it's wonderful. 
in, in my community, when we do our community baby showers, we always look to the churches or, you know, a religious organization because they usually have a nice big space and, uh, you know, they're not going to charge us too much money and they have a kitchen. And they tend to be family and friendly. Fam and e exactly, exactly. And, you know, a big part of the education that we're doing at the community baby shower is breastfeeding. So we are, you know, we in involve the, the church members. They're usually there, you know, at least helping us out for the day. And, and they're always very supportive for what we're doing. So, again, it's just... Raising the level of, of awareness. Yeah, getting uh, everybody, the yeah. grandmothers in the congregation to be aware that yes. this is an important thing and mm -hmm, supportive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the grandmother's tea curricula is out there. You can actually Google that. And mm -hmm. it's really a great way to involve you know, the, the generation of mothers who may not have breastfed their babies. Yeah. When, when we were preparing for this, I found a quote on the Best for Babes website from a pediatrician, I think from Washington, D.C., named Shahira Long. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget what she said. She said, I had one mother share with me that her decision to breastfeed in church was met with remarks that it should be a sin. This was from a child who clearly had not been taught that breastfeeding is the normal way to feed your baby. My response would have been, it can't be a sin because Jesus was breastfed. <laughs> but, you know, women who take their babies, you know, newborns into church with them and they're going to be sitting there for quite a while, the baby is likely to get hungry and nobody wants a screaming baby in the middle of a religious service at the quietest time especially. So of course you're going to want to breastfeed the baby and then to be met with a congregational reaction like that yeah. should be considered yeah. a sin yeah. is just yeah. totally going to undermine yeah. the yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mom's confidence in her mm -hmm. ability and her feeling that she's welcome in that place. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. congregations don't want to convey the message that you aren't welcome here, so I think they're very receptive to the whole mm -hmm. idea that they have a role to play in making a breastfeeding friendly community. Yeah, they don't want people to not come to church or synagogue. They want them to come there, so right. let's accommodate them. Yeah, and um, with Hinduism, when I was preparing the slides, um, any religion whose most iconic um, temple, the Taj Mahal, looks like that has got to be pro-breastfeeding. I mean, look at that. <laughs> yes. Right there. <laughs> so, um, we've alluded over and over again to things happening in the community as a whole, sort of general ambiance, um, that, that influence the breastfeeding friendliness of an area. Um, Stephanie, could you comment a little bit more on that kind of stuff? Well, we, we know that uh, breasts are sexy in our society, so anytime there's a picture of a breastfeeding baby on a poster or a billboard, it always elicits some interesting comments and, and feedback, and we know that from the uh, campaigns that have been run in New, York, in New York State, as a matter of fact, the WIC program got a grant award and we had wonderful breastfeeding campaigns and we saw them on um, sides of buses and billboards and things like that and the reaction was not um, as good as we expected. I mean it really is very controversial and it's really sort of sad that mothers and babies belong together and women can have barely anything on on a you know I went on to a our local mall, ad. You know a, a huge stand-up uh, statues of Victoria's Secret models and hardly anything just in the middle of the mall and that's okay but the mom who's sitting there nursing her baby very discreetly <laughs> covered up you know the, the guard comes over and throws her out it, it's just absurd so the more we see breastfeeding the better off that will be some of the things that we saw on the slide here just putting those pictures out there very very important so you can go to a lot of websites you can download these pictures you should just get them out there if you have and that little breastfeeding welcome here symbol the it's blue a free with logo the breastfeeding mom and baby it's international symbol that was designed and it is free for everybody to use make your own poster but there's a lot of stuff that's out there already and, and we know that it will be controversial but the more we see it out there the, the better off one of the this year, the statewide coalition offered some mini grants, and, and one of the applications that we received was to help them purchase life-size statues that they were going to of breastfeeding mothers, and they were going to plant them around in the in the city, 
Um, and I do believe that New York City is going to be doing that. So we should sort of like see the them. horse sculptures in yes. Saratoga Springs. <laughs> yeah. and yes, the... yes. But mommy's breastfeeding in public places, and they can just move the, the statue around and uh, not the statue, the um, poster board, I guess it is. Oh, um, they're those. Sort of yeah, life -size. Li like life size. Yeah. You know, get your picture taken next to President Clinton. Right, and, right, and, and right. Clinton is a two-dimensional cutout, but yeah. on the photo it doesn't look that right. Way. Right, right, right. Okay. So to put those things out there just to sort of well, normalize breastfeeding. Well, yeah, I think the next campaign should be, you know, for a city to adopt, you know, a lot of cities have these, you know, horse statues all over the place or I don't know what, uh, it's different for yes, each animals. city. But various animals. Yeah, various <laughs> yeah. statues. Yeah. But we could have, you know, a competition for statues sprinkled around a city of breastfeeding yeah mother baby yeah, pairs yeah yeah and that if you look at artwork there's so it. much artwork out there that mothers and babies are breastfeeding so you know get more of that stuff out there but um, well and then we have the negative approach yeah, that appeared on yeah, time magazine yeah that yeah, had that so many help. inappropriate innuendos associated with it yeah but they sold a lot of magazines and that was their purpose that was their so, goal there right, yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, but those are the kind of uh, issues that we have to deal with. They're, it's just sexualized, and it shouldn't mm -hmm. be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shouldn't be at all. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in Europe, I had a uh, breastfeeding talk that I gave for a number of years. That I had found a great bus placard from Rome that was a picture of this smiling baby with his or her head nestled in between his mother's ample breasts. <laughs> and, you know, these buses driving through the streets of Rome, I could not imagine this happening in <laughs> Albany. But maybe we'll get to that point sometime, that people will yeah. think of breasts as part of the mother-baby experience more than part of the selling the next, yeah. you know. Well, in yeah, London, in Westminster West Abbey, where there are many statues, there is a statue of a mother breastfeeding what would probably be a two-year-old. And, of mm. course, you're not supposed to take pictures in Westminster Abbey. And the guard was standing there, and my husband went over to him and said, we need a picture of this <laughs> statue. He said, I can't give you permission, but I'm going to be looking the other way. <laughs> Good for him. Good for him. Well, isn't it downtown Oslo that has a huge statue of a mother with lots of little babies sort of milling around? She's leaning over and with pendulous breasts. You know, so in other countries, this is much more it's very, part of the public space. Yeah. It's just human in here. Yes. Yeah. Human yeah. art form. Yeah. Right. You know, and Stephanie, at the beginning, you alluded to the... Um, public figures yes, um, yes, going yeah. public with yeah, the fact yeah. that they're breastfeeding. Yeah. It, it has been nice to see that, you know, we, we have, um, you know, over in England, <laughs> a certain mommy there gave birth, right. and we're all waiting for her, and thank goodness she's breastfeeding the baby. But and I not giving dummies, dummies, which is yeah. what they call pacifiers yeah, yeah, in England. Yeah. So that's really very, very encouraging, and uh, hopefully... Should be great for English <laughs> breastfeeding yeah. rates. And if, if Kate doesn't have support, I don't know who will. <laughs> exactly, I mean, exactly. Um, there's really no reason for her not to be able to breastfeed that baby. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great role. She can be a great role model. I know I've read, I don't know if it's true or not, that she doesn't want to be that, but she is. Um, she she can, knew that when she, she got into the family. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She but, can be an, a new mom privately and not be on posters as the face of the breastfeeding right, mom, right, but right. still just you know, the fact that she's... Yeah, I mean, here in America, we, we tend to idolize the, the you know, rock stars and the, and the movie stars as opposed to we don't have royalty. But, um, you know, fortunately, we do have some very noticeable celebrities who are choosing to breastfeed, and, and that's important. It's very important, and, and the more African American celebrities we have that are showing breastfeeding, like Beyonce and you know other new moms, really well, very and Michelle important. Obama, and Michelle Obama um, yeah. wasn't a breastfeeding mom when she became but the first lady. Very but supportive, she, though. Yeah, she was a breastfeeding mom when Sasha and Malia were little, and she's been very supportive, like including lots of mentions of breastfeeding in the her white paper about childhood obesity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. those, she and Beyonce are two very prominent African-American faces for breastfeeding being the way to go. 
Well, she lived in Chicago at the time, and, and uh, the local Lash League helped her breastfeed. Good and for them. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, the media is really very important to people these days, and with Facebook banning pictures of <laughs> breastfeeding, it makes it um, interesting to read Facebook, but I, I think it's really such a great and tool And interesting to, have. to moderate a New York statewide breastfeeding coalition <laughs> Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, needs to yeah, change. Yeah, but um, it, it really is, is a great tool to get out the information that mothers need so they do feel supported, at least electronically. They know there's a place for them to go and they can, you know, Twitter and, and get tweets from celebrities who are talking about their breastfeeding experiences. So it, it, it's all good. I think we're going to continue to see our breastfeeding rates, at least initiation, increase. The... Um, CDC just released their maternity practice infant nutrition scores just yesterday, and we do see that we still need improvement, though. We, we know that even though mothers go into the hospital choosing to breastfeed, very often they're given formula for whatever reason, but we need to continue to work on that so we can help those mothers exclusively breastfeed their, their babies, and that will help them to continue. As you mentioned earlier, the Healthy People 2020 goals are really including or including exclusive breastfeeding. You didn't mention the the rates now, but we need to work towards that. And in order to work towards that, all the community stuff needs to get better. Yeah, especially it for needs the to duration get better. goals. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have another clip from the documentary about this issue of getting comfortable with breastfeeding in the public marketplace. Why don't we take a look at that next? We all need to just become more comfortable with nursing. This is the president of uh, Venezuela um, talking to a young woman who's nursing. We can't go to a restaurant and, and cover up and be comfortable nursing our babies without someone saying something to us. I try to tell the young ladies I work with all the time, I, when I t try to talk to them about breastfeeding and they say, well, I'm going to try. I'm like, nah. No, I don't want to hear that. This, this is what I want you to say. This is going to be the new mantra. Yes, I, I can, I will, and, and watch me. I'm going to do this. <laughs> Thank you. So I take it, Dr. Lawrence, that you were the origin of, yes, I can, I will, and watch me. And Kim Marie Bug learned that from you. Well, I, I wouldn't take credit for that. <laughs> no, but I think it's, it's a certainly word. your attitude. <laughs> she I, absorbed I think it's it. <laughs> such an important attitude to have, and uh, we need to support mothers thinking of that. Build that confidence. Yeah. Breastfeeding yeah. is a confidence Absolutely. racket. Yeah, nope. you know, uh, some of the, the, the mommies that come to my breastfeeding classes are, they're so confident in everything else that they do. They're business women and, you know, they've got it all together, their schedules and their blackberries and, and everything. And they come to the breastfeeding class and they're just sort of like deer in headlights. Like, oh, <laughs> their own mothers may not have breastfed them. They've, their friends haven't breastfed their babies. Or maybe they have and they're just sort of overwhelmed by the whole thing. And their mother-in-laws. And their mother-in-laws. <laughs> well. <laughs> I always say that I'm not, you know, anti-mother-in-law, but very very often, that's the real sticky wicket is that, is that the mother-in-law wants her, her grandson or granddaughter to gain enough weight and be a nice healthy baby and we need to use formula and there's no way you have enough milk in those little breasts or big breasts or whatever the issue is. But the, the family system is very uh, important. But I, I think that we need to really continue with prenatal breastfeeding education. Um, and it's, it's very difficult because women don't know what they don't know. And childbirth classes in, in general are less attended than they ever were. I mean, back in my day, everybody, you know, you looked for your Lamaze class or your Bradley or, or whatever class you you're going to. You figured that was the ticket to get to the hospital to have your baby. Yes, yes, you had to take the class. And, and nowadays you can go on Facebook and get all the information you need or, uh -huh. uh, you know, or the Internet and, and look something up and, and watch, you know, things on television that you think See are going to. See childbirth. Uh, yeah. movie on TV yeah, instead. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the, the education is really key and we know, at least in my organization, that it makes a difference. The, the women that have come through our classes, we do, we keep records on them and we, they do have better success with breastfeeding. They have less cesarean sections and we're likely to get what they want out of their birth experience and the breastfeeding experience. And even going back to the WIC participants, we have WIC participants that are nursing their babies at a year and beyond, which was not happening yeah, before. Yeah, that was not at all happening. Generation ago. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So progress is being yes. made. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, before we wrap up, I wanted to mention the U.S. Breastfeeding Committee has a wonderful section of their website with lots of stories about um, success stories about how women were supported in their breastfeeding by members of their family, by their work site, by their faith community, by their employer, by all different parts of the community. So if you're looking for inspiration for something that you or your group can do in your community to help raise the level of support in your area for breastfeeding, it's a great resource to go and just mm -hmm. read some of those stories and see how things can change for the better to make a more right. pro-breastfeeding environment. Right. And for those of you in other states that are watching, if you go to the USBC website, you can connect with your local coalition in your state. We're all listed on the website. And um, if you ever see my car in the parking lot, I have the bumper sticker. Everyone can help make breastfeeding easier, and you can probably still make a donation and get a bumper sticker for your car, too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because that is the message that just like there are many opportunities to undermine breastfeeding, there are also opportunities for all of us to work toward making breastfeeding more successful and mm -hmm. more prevalent mm -hmm. and all those things. Everyone plays a part. Yeah. yeah. So all of these things working together form what um, a, an editorial in The Lancet from, what, 20 years ago almost, 1994, so almost 20 years old, um, John Dobbing et al. referred to as a warm chain for breastfeeding. Um, in, in the world of public health, in the immunization world specifically, there's been attention over the decades to the cold chain, which is a system of governments and community organizations working together to get vaccines to the farthest corners of the planet, still cold and still effective. Um, Dobbing and colleagues were making the point that breastfeeding doesn't need a cold chain. In fact, especially 20 years ago, breastfeeding often got the cold shoulder. But what breastfeeding needs is a warm chain, people at every level, um, support in the hospital, and then people that the hospital folks can turn the mother over to when she leaves the hospital so that she knows that she'll get that next level of support in her breastfeeding. So altogether, it actually should probably, instead of be a, being a warm chain, it's more like a warm web for breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And as you said, all of us have a role to play yeah, in supporting right. breastfeeding. And there's a, a wonderful new national initiative called Best, Best Fed Beginnings that's working with, I think, 90 hospitals across the United States to really help them make those connections to their community. We've just finished up doing community assessments to see what's what are the gaps in the community? Why is there no um, referral to a support group? Or maybe there is no support group, and maybe the hospital needs to, st to start a mommy group so that we have more support out in the community. But breastfeeding um, really is something that we all need to be involved with to mm -hmm. help those mommies. Well, even John Dobbin said it's a confidence game. Mm -hmm. And that is so important in, as a thread through all we do. Yeah. Well, New York City is talking about developing breastfeeding empowerment zones. I'm just dying to see what those look like when they are all up and running, because that's such a great idea, a breastfeeding empowerment zone, because it's the same kind of thing, the confidence and the mm -hmm, empowerment mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, yes, I can, I will, and watch me. Yes. So with that, why don't we turn back to Kim Marie Bug and let her have the last word in the show today. And then we do have some time for questions. We already have some that have been phoned in and faxed in. So let's go to Kim Marie Bug and then your questions. We feel that we can make a major difference. It's about images and being positive. And one of the main things we like to say is instead of hearing people say, well, I'll try that, yes, I can, I will, watch me do it. So thank you, Kim Marie. Even though you aren't here in person, <laughs> we've missed you and we've been thinking about you this whole time. So. Let's go to the, some of the questions from the audience next. Here's one that we've touched on a little bit. A challenge for many moms is having a job in a gas station or small store 
where they are the only employee. Also, wait staff have a hard time with busy tables, busy environment. Please comment on or give some ideas about how that can be solved. This is from Jessica in Vermont. Well, I, I would say that one of the things is, of course, talking to the business owner to see what arrangements can be made. Maybe you can work shorter shifts so that you're not expected to be there at the, the time. Um, but having the opportunity to go to your car possibly to pump, you know, women have used that with portable pumps. Um, but really, it needs to be a conversation. There are solutions, but it needs to have a conversation with your employer to see what works for them as well. Maybe you can go into the boss's office for you know, 20 minutes, two times a day or three times a day, whatever is needed. Well, I think one of the key things about that question was that this is the only employer on the premises at the time. At that moment, and, yeah. And that uh, I think until our community is comfortable with the clerk coming to <laughs> with a pump on her, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, if yeah. President Chavez can stand yes. there <laughs> talking with that mom breastfeeding yeah. right out there yeah. with the cameras yeah. rolling, yeah. Yeah. you know, if he can do it, then mm. the customer at the yeah. gas station yeah. can do it too. Eventually, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Hopefully. I mean, I would equate the wait staff to the same as nurses working in the hospitals. I mean, they have long shifts and they're busy on their feet all the time. But if you if you make it a priority and you and you work with your employer right. to see how we can I mean you're not going to be doing this for the next ten years it may just be the next three or four months that you need to pump three times a day and eventually you know your child is going to be having solid food so we can actually do that sort of reverse nursing thing so that the baby doesn't really need to get as much pumped milk. Well, babies sometimes adapt to this yes. and and they sleep while mother's working. Yes. Yeah. And of course, they wake up and want to eat all the time she's home. But the baby adapts too, so that's part mm -hmm. of this picture. We're mm -hmm. expecting yeah, a lot of the employer, baby system. right, right. But we can adapt the baby too to right. the picture. Can the child care provider bring her baby to her, you know, once a day, mm -hmm. so she can just nurse? And really, the customer seeing a mom nursing should be more comfortable than seeing the mom pumping. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's more more overtones yeah. of the dairy yeah. industry yeah. than yeah. many people yeah. would really be keen about. I think. Um, but that is a challenge, and easier for the mom too. Yes, yeah. the, it's definitely yeah. a challenging situation, yeah. and yeah. starting early to talk it through and and come up with solutions. Solutions prior to that moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. Next question from the audience. I'm, let's see, heading the breastfeeding initiative in Warwick at St. Anthony's Community Hospital. They didn't say what Warwick. There's one in Rhode Island. There are probably Warwicks oh. in many states. <laughs> so wherever you are, um, I'm trying to get a tent going for Warwick's Apple Fest. Any tips? Well, call Having me. I live in <laughs> the right hand side of Warwick. So whoever you are. Oh. Um, yeah, that's in, in my community. And Apple Fest is a huge, a oh, huge okay. event. Oh, OK, so it is Warwick, New York. Yeah, okay. it's a huge event. So. Um, just uh, you find have me. local you suppliers. Probably know me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can help out with that. Excellent. Okay. Another question: Are any efforts being made to try to work with the service sector to make the workplaces more breastfeeding friendly? For example, fast food restaurants. Well, it, it's a work in progress. It's an absolute work in progress. And as I mentioned before. The New York State Department of Health WIC program does have their Making It Work Toolkit, which is available on their website online. Lots of good tips and ideas and handouts and for both employees and employers. But this is going to take a lot of work. You know, nationally, it's going to be a, a huge uphill climb. You know, with, without having better paid maternity leave, something has to give. And we are asking businesses to make these accommodations, but really if we could just let mommy stay home longer and make some money, we would probably eliminate those issues. Mm -hmm. Well, this is why, although we haven't talked about milk banks or anything like that, there is a new um, cooperative milk bank in Michigan, which is operating around the country, with the idea that here are these mothers with this milk and they need to earn money and so forth. 
And a co-op is very different than an industry. And this co-op is owned by the, you can't belong to the co-op unless you're lactating and contribute <laughs> milk. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a beautiful concept. It is. And with all this need for mother's milk and that sort, to have something that women can belong to and control and contribute to and earn some money so they can stay home and breastfeed their own babies. So it's a little action to watch. Right. Very interesting. Stay tuned for mm -hmm. future breastfeeding mm -hmm. Grand Mountains. Yes. Um, okay, we got a call from Cheryl from Madi the Madison County Health Department. Um, where will the rocking, Rock and Rest Station be at the New York State Fair in Syracuse at the end of August? She would like to promote it. Does it do either of you have any I, about I'm that? not from that area, so I don't know. Um, yeah, there's this whole huge statewide yeah, agricultural state fair, fair yeah. in Syracuse yeah. every year. But mm -hmm. you're from the Finger Lakes, you're from the Mid-Hudson, yeah. I'm from the Capital Region. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I would suggest if you're not uh, associated or affiliated with your local breastfeeding coalition, go onto the USB website, find your coalition and contact them and say if, if they have something that they're setting up there. Well, and Syracuse does have a lot of activities yeah. mm -hmm. right. uh, throughout the region because they run mm -hmm. from Watertown to mm -hmm. Binghamton. Mm -hmm. yeah, and well, the Onondaga County Health Department may well yes. know as well. Right, right. Or even the right. State Fair website, they might uh, that's, have a map. That's true. That would have, yeah, if they already mm -hmm. had one, it's probably on their, on their map already. We're on the map and some of the other ones since we've been there several For times. A long time, yeah. Um, but the State Fair is more than it's it's a long fair it's like 10 days i think yes yeah, it's, it's yeah. a huge so event that that's a lot of volunteer effort um and that's one of the reasons we never did the orange county fair because it was 10 days long and it's just <laughs> it's just overwhelming to try to organize all that the other county fairs are you know five days or six days or a week yeah. maybe and then it seems well, we have reasonable. a local one that's about four days but. yeah yeah and that well, you can and they could going. recruit. I mean, I could see yeah. a group of yeah. volunteers coming from Rochester to help them out and spell them and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. when I was at the State Health Department, they always recruited people to go staff the Health Department's right. booth mm -hmm. at the State Fair. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's a project for the Statewide Breastfeeding Coalition. Absolutely. Launch a rock and rest station at the State Fair and get people from all over the we state need, to... Yeah. Yeah. Chip in, yeah. you know, half a day yeah. each. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. As if the <laughs> add that to our agenda for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah doesn't yeah. doesn't have yeah. enough to do already. Yeah. We'll yeah. add that to yeah. the list. Okay, uh, one more question. Do you have any good success stories or tips related to addressing a workplace that was reluctant to encourage breastfeeding, but then came around? Hmm. Um. The, the, you know, the one thing that just pops into my head is um, the, in, in Orange County, we're in a, a county department building and one of the sheriffs who drives her car around with a bulletproof vest on and everything mm. needed a place to pump. And um, they, they gave her a hard time at first, um, you know, because they wanted her to use the locker room, the bathroom. and. We ended up making this great change in the county so that in every county building, so she's driving all, every county building she would come into, there was a space for her to go and pump. So we, we made it work. A floating a lactation float, room. Floating, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and I think the health care facilities have to be the model. Yeah. If we don't have such facilities in the hospital, in the health department, and so forth, how can we ask somebody yes. else? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why when we did the business case for breastfeeding training, we said start with your own organization. You'll be the model for your community about what you've done and what changes right. you've made. And we've but seen that. But in this particular situation where somebody has just converted <laughs> to the religion, uh, they, they need support yeah. and compliment and thank you very much and and everybody rising up and recognizing mm -hmm. that they have taken a great leap of faith. Yes, yeah. And it's one of the things at the coalition level that we'll be talking about tomorrow is, is how to do a little bit more recognition of the businesses that have made these great strides and, you know, accomplish something for the nursing mothers and their employee. Yeah. That would actually be this afternoon. Oh, that's we, so we got off right. early this morning. I've been but up it, early, yeah. yeah, the day yes, is the rest still of the day, young. Yes, yes, <laughs> thank you. The coalition meetings today. Yeah. So, um, what are the best strategies that you've found for getting grandmothers onto the breastfeeding bandwagon, i.e., helping them become effective breastfeeding supporters? 
just talking to them. I mean, we, when uh, at the WIC clinic at our baby talk, you know, we have grandmothers that are bringing their daughters in and just starting those conversations with them ab about it, and it makes a difference. And they, they really, they really want to know. They really want to know. They want the information because a lot of times the first thing they'll tell me is, "Well, I couldn't," and I said, "Well." probably weren't supported you know tell me about your birth it wasn't experience your fault it wasn't their fault and tell me about your birth experience and women remember everything that happened during their birth so decades it's, later. it's a real icebreaker <laughs> yeah, decades, it's a real icebreaker to meet with the, the women in, in the you know waiting rooms and just having that plain old simple conversation with her really gets her we have a little pamphlet that's designed just for the grandmother or the grand the grandparents of the breastfed baby so they get something of their own um, we give them our phone number. You can call us. One of the things that we want to do is the grandmother's tea. We just haven't gotten to do a formal setting yet, but we do meet with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The grandmother's tea. Grandmother's that's tea. Sort of like the breastfeeding cafe, yes, but for yeah, grandmas. For the grandmas to come. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of programs need to do that, and I think your approach to saying, "Well, tell me what happened when you had your children." Uh, because they pass down these myths. Well, you yeah. aren't going to be able to breastfeed because I couldn't. Yeah, exactly. You know, and that kind of thing. Nobody in my family could ever breastfeed, right. so you won't right. be able to do you that. Know, I, my, you know, I didn't have enough milk. Well, tell me what happened. Yet they are like, diagnosing oh. the problem yeah. wrong. It wasn't yeah. them. Yeah. It was the environment yeah. that they were working yeah. in, mm -hmm. yeah. living in. Yeah. Was, well, yeah. and many people interpret the fact that, you know, initially you're kind of engorged and so forth that when that engorgement goes away and your breasts are pretty, in, including physicians, who don't realize that that, that It's breast, a little milk machine. It isn't will a gallon jug. It will produce the milk when it's called for. <laughs> yeah. And that the engorgement uh, dissipation is normal You don't want to stay engorged for the entire duration <laughs> of the lactation so period. So many women stop breastfeeding because they don't ha think right. they have milk just right. because they're not engorged gourds like they used to be. Right, right. So, you know, if these these are moms that come back to us at the WIC clinic a week after they've had their baby with the same sentiment, they, they don't have any milk and they can't do this, and, well, come in my little office, let's see, and put the baby to breast, and the baby's like right there, and they go, oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And oh. listen, you hear that swallow, swallow, yeah. swallow, yeah. the baby is swallowing milk. Baby There's wants milk. to breastfeed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and you weigh them and, and mm -hmm. you take a history of wet diapers and all that sort of thing. That's so important part yeah. of the, the diagnosis. And so let's get some more of our questions. What can community coalitions do to make sure lactation support is available to women who don't qualify for WIC since WIC has become such a force for yeah. breastfeeding? <laughs> well, I would say that you... are getting jealous. <laughs> Uh, the model of the baby cafe, you can actually go to their website and, and look up how they've done that. And those are not just for WIC moms. A baby cafes are really for all moms. Work with your local hospital, see if they will allow you to run a, uh, a mommy group there. Some of the hospitals are very happy if somebody else will come in and do it. Um, but th there's, there's ways to do things. You just have to get a group of people together and go for it. Just do it. Just you know, build it and they will come. They'll mm -hmm. be there. And with social media, it's really easy to reach out to all the mommies that are out there. Well, we're talking as if we just invented this yeah. whole idea. <laughs> well, <let's really laughs> right. But the yeah. league has been yeah. here for, for over yeah. 50 years. Yes, yes. And that's where mothers went. And, yeah. uh, uh, and the La Leche, I mean, the, and the WIC program is trying to compensate for the fact that the league wasn't active in, in WIC those kind of communities. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Yolan, um, a generation ago, I was part of a group in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, of nursing mothers counselors, and there were we were based at the Harrisburg Hospital, and there were 30 of us. So every month we would each take a day, go into the hospital, meet all of the new moms who had said they were planning to breastfeed. We didn't get to talk to the people who weren't planning to breastfeed, right, but right. you know. And then we would uh, make follow-up phone calls to them, go visit them if they wanted somebody to come and help them that way. So there, there are lots of mechanisms for sort of recreating all the wonderful stuff that right, right. WIC has done. Right. And Breastfeeding USA is another new organization that's out there with the community level moms one-on-one -on -one support. So look, look them up too. Well, and there's a, uh, a new lactation consultant, a whole new specialty, if you will. And uh, 
we ought to be working with the lactation consultants. We're very fortunate. We have six on our normal birth center. We have three more in the NICU, and uh, so. Again, and the ideal situation. <laughs> exactly, but they're lactation consultants yes. in the community yeah. too. Yeah. So we, you all, mm -hmm. all come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question. Please comment on how coalitions can impact formula marketing and the distribution in physicians' offices. Uh, there's, there's a challenge. <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, it, it's definitely something that we always talk about. We know that in New York City, they you probably all heard about the Latch On campaign that was, I think that was last year, maybe the year before then. Time, Time flies. flies. <laughs> um, but the fact that the health department down there realized that hospitals were marketing agents for the formula companies and they asked for voluntary hospitals to not market formula. So it was a big backlash. Of course the media latched latched onto that and you know called Mayor Bloomberg the you know the nanny state, et cetera. But really the idea was that hospitals are offering health care. They shouldn't be selling products or giving products away or being an arm of the formula companies. And I really I really think that free women... Free advertising. Free advertising, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we know that now that um, many hospitals are going after baby-friendly status or working on the 10 steps to improve their breastfeeding at the hospitals, that the formula companies need to go elsewhere to market their... Um, Stuff and they're going after pediatric offices, OBGYN well, offices. So as a group, <laughs> do not take. Uh, so they've gone to the obstetrical offices. Right, right. But we still hear in our down. in our community that you know they are getting information from their healthcare providers about formula because they signed up, you know, for baby pictures or whatever it is, a magazine, and then the formula company has their home address and they've got a case of formula on their doorstep, and mm -hmm. they may not have even thought about formula feeding, but once it's there. We're all up in arms about what the NSA is finding out about yeah. us, but <laughs> yeah. you know, the formula yeah. companies yeah. have yeah. their surveillance yeah. teams yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the fact that the United States has not signed on to the, um, the WHO code, the World Health Organization code of marketing of infant um, of breast milk substitutes it makes it really difficult, really difficult to have any any say in getting rid of that marketing. But uh, there is an organization, uh, WABA, w -A -B -A dot org, mm -hmm. and there's a national organization that's run, I think, by Marsha Walker, and she takes all these reports. So you can look that stuff up online and just report on these violations of the code, even though the United States is not signed a signatory. on. Signatory, right, still right. It's the mm -hmm. but. Still, I think that standards we're aiming for. Right, right. I think that still just educating mothers. It's one of the tools I use in my classes. We, we take out a, a baby magazine and like show me the pictures of breastfeeding. Well, every other page is formula. It's like this is how good they are at getting you to believe that formula is, is the, the norm. norm. Right. Well, unfortunately, the United States is the only large country that did not sign on. Exactly. And uh, the uh, WHO code says you shall not advertise breast milk substitutes. substitutes yeah. So the magazines that take their ads are breaking the code. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. They're on television now. It really is very mm -hmm. disheartening. Mm -hmm. So here's another kind of related um, issue. I'm interested in what you think about the language we use as healthcare professionals to try to normalize breastfeeding. Talking about it in terms of benefits, ideal or optimum, sets the stage that it's something higher than what's normal. What are your thoughts? What about using the term infant feeding to mean breastfeeding, assuming that it's just the way you feed your baby? How do we use language, how can we use language to normalize this as the behavior? Uh, I'd say that's, that's really key to what we do is that we expect that you will breastfeed your baby. It's just the way we feed babies. And we continue to use that language, at least in the work that, that I do. Well, I think uh, this is referring to the various uh, written materials mm -hmm. about the benefits of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. uh, there also is the verbiage where, what are the risks of not breastfeeding? Mm -hmm. And that does change the whole concept. Turns the tables. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the cost of not breastfeeding, Melissa Bartok's work, out of Harvard, 
has shown that we'd save billions of health care dollars, but the, the risk of not bre breastfeeding is increased otitis media, increased illness, increased asthma, and reduced IQ litany. as the baby right. grows up. Right. Really turning, turning that message around is so important. When I first started and I did my community resource brochure, and you know we listed some of the benefits, but I also put down that infant feed, formula use increases the risk of such and such. And I got phone calls from the nurses in the hospitals like, you can't say that. <laughs> well, you show me otherwise. So it's still in there. But now they've come around. And as a matter of fact, the hospital in my community actually has a wonderful brochure in English and Spanish, the 14 risks of formula. So, and well, they're giving it out. you actually can do this without saying the word formula. Yeah. <laughs> it's the risk of not breastfeeding. Not breastfeeding. And you haven't insulted anybody. Yeah. Yep. Or hopefully you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, people, people get so caught up in this or that increases the risk of breastfeeding, like knowing exactly what type of plastic is in the cups you're drinking mm -hmm. water out of. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> but not breastfeeding your baby increases the mother's own risk of breast cancer much mm -hmm. more than mm -hmm. these subtle differences in plastic types. Right. I mean, not, not to dismiss those by any means because we are exposed to all kinds of chemicals, mm -hmm. but one thing that we have control over ourselves is decisions we make about feeding our babies. And if we choose not to breastfeed our babies, we're putting ourselves at all kinds of increased risk as well as putting our babies mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. higher risks. Mm -hmm. And there's an article that just came out uh, two days ago in JAMA, a uh, very definitive article on thousands of children showing uh, the intellectual impact mm -hmm. of uh, exclusive breastfeeding. Yeah, and that's one of those intergenerational things that you can really mm -hmm. you know, help to break mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. intergenerational cycles of disadvantage by giving exactly. people, exactly. giving babies the best possible start in their intellectual development. Right. So it's up to all of us to expect mothers to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. We're getting more questions in all the time. <laughs> and we don't have all that many oh. minutes to go. <laughs> Any pointers for how to work with dads on becoming breastfeeding supporters? Dad's tease probably won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> um, the fathers that have been in the classes that have done really bond with each other and uh, I, there are videos out there that are specifically aimed at, at dads and breastfeeding so you can look up some of those things but Michael Jordan was breastfed for three, was day, three years, three I, mean, years I thought yeah. that was a good one yeah. well yeah. Bill Cosby was breastfed also oh we tried to get him on one of our ads about 10 years ago and when he was uh, Dr. Huckleby, mm -hmm. uh, and he declined, he demurred. Oh, well, maybe but now he did, he's not busy. Admit he was <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I think just engaging the fathers, and there are models out there. Um, Dad's boot camp is one of the models, and it's the classes, the information sessions are run by fathers, so they are able to talk to each other. And I've had lots of the fathers that have said to me, "If you want me to come back, and I'll talk about it." So yes, you can come back and talk to the next group. So again, it's that peer to peer type of model that works very well. Mm -hmm. And New York, I just wanted to mention that New York City uh, Department of Mental Health and Hygiene has just published a wonderful new prenatal breastfeeding curriculum. It's available on their website. You can download it. You can use it to teach dads. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, we, I think we only have time for one more question, so apologize, apologies to the people we aren't getting to your questions. Um, but here's one. How can we improve our work with child care providers to encourage initiation and follow through on becoming ba breastfeeding friendly? All, all I can say is if, if you are the local IBCLC in the area, knock on their door, make an appointment, and offer yourself to do an in-service training to their staff. I mean, they, they may sit there like this for the first hour, which they've done with me, but by the end of it, they, they get it. They really get it. But they, they didn't have the information before. They didn't see the value of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, so it's and up to everybody out there to do that education. Well, and also to publicize and congratulate the, uh, the child care centers who do support right, breastfeeding. Right. And here in New York State, and they actually the um, child, uh, CACFP actually has an award yeah. that they designate breastfeeding friendly child care practices. So yeah, the, it's something the they can child and adult feeding program. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and on the internet, I think you can find ratings yes. of child care centers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the more women realize that and you know, vote mm -hmm. with their feet by switching child right. care providers, right. Right. if they have one who's not supporting breastfeeding, the more people mm -hmm. will get the mm -hmm. message. Well, and also from the child care center's point of view, emphasizing the huge value in terms of keeping babies from getting infectious yes. diseases that will spread yes. throughout the center, yes. you would think they would yes. be strong advocates just on that ground alone. Mm -hmm. So I think that we've reached the end of time and as usual are leaving more questions on the <laughs> line, but I think we got to, the, to most of the important ones. So thank you, Stephanie Sosnowski and Ruth Lawrence for a wonderful morning. And thank you in the audience for tuning in to this morning's broadcast. We hope you've learned a lot about community-wide efforts to promote breastfeeding. We know that many of you are interested in having all of your staff watch this archive broadcast at some point. Fortunately, it's now World Breastfeeding Month. So the broadcast, it always takes a couple of weeks before it's available on the School of Public Health website, but it'll be there in a couple of weeks, so keep your eye on, on it. And by the end of August, all of your staff ought to be able to see it. Um, our website is www.albany.edu slash sph slash con ed. That's not coned, it's con ed. And you'll find the link there to the archived broadcast. Um, all of our past Breastfeeding Grand Rounds broadcasts are available on the website as well. If you want more about the workplace, more about um, family um, maternity and parental leave that we did last year, et cetera, et cetera. So we really encourage you to go to that site to see more of the work we've done over the years. We hope you'll join us next year. Next year, I think is the 17th edition of Breastfeeding Grand Rounds. I think we're up to more than that, but for the first year it was a live, small thing rather than this big broadcast. So I think we're just up to the 17th broadcast wow. next year, but we're getting close to our 20th anniversary. Wow. Um, as usual, we will be broadcasting on the Thursday morning of World Breastfeeding Week. Next year, that's going to be August 7th, so mark your calendars. We'll start at 8.30 a.m. again. Mark it in ink. We'll be there. I hope you will be, too. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next year. Happy World Breastfeeding Week. Thank you both for being here, and enjoy the rest of the week.